So, we're back talking about the manga that, now that I think about it, I can never shut up about Kingdom. The world of war, assault, mass murder, genocide, torture, and pretty much anything that encompasses death. Today, we are going to be focusing on the man who uses all that as a tool. He goes by many names, the Beheader, the Fifth Great, King of Darkness, King of Outcasts, Kin's Prodigy, but I like to call him something different, something more befitting of him. Conki, the general of demon time. And trust me, I have more than enough receipts to prove what an absolute savage this guy is. And I don't mean that in a term of endearment, like the way Megan the Stallion calls herself a savage. I'm a savage. Yeah. I mean that in the literal sense, this man is a fucking savage. Oxford Dictionary definition savage from making a rainbow arc out of civilian bodies and appendages walking up to the enemy hq like a pimp ordering a mass genocide and one question by the king why he did it saying because he felt like it this man is the very definition of i don't give a fuck so without further ado starting us off with receipt number 277 Now ladies and gentlemen, receipt number 277 consists of one of the most cold-blooded moments that I've ever witnessed in manga. In an arc I would consider to be top 5 manga arcs of all time. Receipt number 277 consists of first degree arson. As we all know, the coalition war is going on. Armies from 5 out of the 7 kingdoms, Han, Chu, Zhao, Wei, and Yan, have come together to destroy Kin with a total number of troops surpassing 500 and 40,000. And at this point, the coalition army is struggling to take Kankoku Pass, the keystone to winning this very war. Kankoku Pass is so large that no siege ladders will make it anywhere near the top, so the Kin army has the upper hand, until one thing to shake up the battle arrives. So as a siege tower makes its way towards Kankoku Pass, they're like, oh, it's just a shitty siege tower. Pfft. We fine. You see, Kankoku Pass has a rich history, and the 100 years since it was built, not a single enemy has managed to break through this pass. To make it through these gates seems simply impossible and more like a fairy tale. That is the National Gate of Kin, Kankoku Pass. But then out of fucking nowhere, this siege tower just slingshots up a ramp on top of Kankoku Pass and Wei soldiers begin to climb, breaking that unbeaten record for the first time in a hundred years, with Gohome saying this siege tower was specifically designed for this very pass. With a newfound fighting spirit within the coalition army, hundreds of soldiers begin to make their way up the siege tower and on top of Kankoku Pass. With the Kin army fighting back the Wei soldiers, a second siege tower in the distance appears, and is heading right for Kanki. And I just want to take a second and say that I feel truly sorry for the soldiers of Wei. They just made history and it looks like they're about to win this war before the first day is even over. Even other generals of the coalition army are jealous of what's taking place. But you know, they really fucked up when they started heading towards Kanki's position. Like, that is the dumbest thing they could have ever done. As the second siege tower makes its way on top of the pass, it's an all-out brawl. Soldiers from both sides taking heavy casualties, but with the coalition army having a never-ending supply of soldiers, it's looking pretty bad for Ken. That is, until Kanki has the genius idea to use the oil he stole from the capital and to throw it onto the siege tower, with him lighting it on fire with a fire arrow, burning hundreds of men in the siege tower, around the siege tower, not to mention everyone breathing in all that smoke. Kanki sent hundreds of soldiers to their death, with a smile on his face. Wei soldiers crying out, screaming in pain, and this man is so fucked in the head that he was laughing while he watched them burn. He's a fucking menace to society. Then he looks out to the Wei army and says, you bunch of bitches are getting too ahead of yourselves. This man only operates on demon time. Now, in the world of Kingdom, everyone has got their own little quirks and fucked up things about them. Ozen is a heartless bastard that wants to be the king of his own kingdom someday. Oki was just a freak of nature in about every single way possible. Shin is a fucking idiot except for when it comes to war, but Kanki, this guy is just another level. And I'm gonna be honest right here, this single act is probably the most tamed thing he has ever done so far in this series. Sending hundreds, if not thousands of soldiers to their death by burning is one of the most tamed things I've seen him do. Let that sink in for a moment. So yeah, 
That was receipt number 277, and it's finally time to move on to receipt number 481. Alright ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you receipt number 481. Breaking every war crime there has ever been. So after the coalition war arc and the state of I arc, we are now brought to the Kokoyo campaign arc, where Shin and Kanki meet for the first time and combine both armies to take a strategic area for both Jiao and Kin. Now there's a lot of shit that goes on in this arc. Uh, the Kanki and Shin combined army are up against Kisha, the man closest to taking the final seat among Zhao III's great heavens, and Kisui, a man of great renown and the leader of his own little city, Ragan. And these four generals face off against each other in one of the most brutal campaigns that I've ever read. In a manga about war, it's expected for things to get gruesome sometimes, but this arc is just downright horrendous. The way this fight starts off is just very bad for Ken. I mean, they've fallen for it every single trap that was set up by Kisui and Kisha, with Shin struggling to pretty much do anything and Kanki right off the bat forced to use his most powerful trump card he has, the Zeno clan. This clan is made up of war hungry savages, beasts like men. If gorillas were humans, this is what they would look like. I mean, these people use boulders as weapons, Jesus Christ. And they wrecked complete havoc on the battlefield. And as bad as things were, and trust me, they were looking pretty dire, they still managed to deal a big blow to the enemy because at the end of the day Kisha's army is up against an army of mountain bandits so from the beginning Zhao was at a huge disadvantage and this is what it would be like almost throughout the whole arc both sides playing mind games with each other specifically the supreme commanders Kisha and Kanki but we all know that the Haishin unit is never one to sit still Kyokai went off by herself to try and assassinate Ryoto an army general under Kisui's command and although they both lived, they were heavily injured. Kyokai was able to make it to safety to a nearby village where an old lady treated her wounds and uh, told her the history of Kisui and Ragan. Meanwhile, Shin and the rest are fighting a river battle. And let me just say, even in this chaotically gruesome campaign, there are still moments of a genuine beauty. Like when we see N, the most average man in all of the Haishin unit, cross the most dangerous part of the river to flank the enemy. He's able to pull this off because there's not a more dependable man in the Haishin unit. Unit. He's the most clutch person in the entire series. And with the Haishin unit taking control of the river and beating back one of the enemy's main divisions, there were other battles unfolding. Kanki and his army planned to take control over the center hill, the most crucial point. But right when Kin seemed to have the upper hand, they were quickly defeated by Kisui and his men. After that, that was pretty much the end of the second day. And it would be the third day that Kanki would finally show how many fucks he gives. The Kin army has an overwhelming advantage over Zhao, with a Haishin unit having complete control over the right flank and Kanki's army looking to spill blood and finally take control over the center hill. Even the enemy commanders, Kisui and Kisha, knew that they were at a huge disadvantage at this point and the clash would be the most decisive one yet. Everything was looking up for Ken and with everyone in place, the only thing both sides waited for was for Kanki to make the first move. But it would be at the point where the sun was already setting that everyone realized this man never intended to fight at all today. He was too busy smiling and laughing at everyone and getting his shoulders massaged that Kanki simply allowed the third day to come to a close without a single move. That's how many fucks this man gives. Zero. Kanki starts off the fourth day the way any man wishes he could, in a bed full of women. The fourth day would become the most critical day, because no matter how stupid Kanki and his actions may seem, everything he does is well planned out. This man is playing 4D chess while everyone is playing checkers. The reason he let the third day slip away was because he was trying to get a read on Kisha and what kind of general he is. Kanki was more than happy than to sit still even on the fourth day because everywhere on the battlefield was a stalemate except for the right flank. Kanki laid a trap for Kisha and he didn't even know. Like I said, everyone on the battlefield is a stalemate except for the right flank, where Shin is. Kisha became so impatient for Kanki to move that Kisha tried to force Kanki to move by cutting off his most powerful piece the Haishin unit. This was the trap and Kisha fell for it. Right when he left the center hill, the Zeno clan flanked from behind, cutting right through the entire Zhao army with their only goal to kill Kisha and bring an end to this. But one doesn't just simply kill someone that is the closest person to taking the third seat of Zhao's three great heavens. In the ensuing onslaught, Kisha is able to sneak away and with him escaping, both Kanki and Kisha thought the same thing. What a waste of a day. They both tried to gauge each other's abilities and mind 
mindset and both failed. But both Konki and Keisha thought they were the main protagonists of this series and forgot they were side characters. You see, one doesn't simply try to kill Shin and the High Shin unit and live to tell the tale. No, 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 no. In all the chaos that was going on, Shin and his unit managed to slip away and with them recovered and regrouped, they went for Keisha. And let me tell you, this, this was no cakewalk. I mean, Shin was leading the charge, swinging his glaive, cutting people in half, launching them in the air, and right as they're about to reach Keisha, they are flanked by Ryoto. But then Kyokai finally makes an appearance onto the battlefield, and what an amazing entrance it is with her cutting through the enemy like butter. And with everyone out the way, Shin finally fights Keisha and his battalion. Shin was going solo dolo for a second, screaming at Keisha about Oki and how he was able to inspire his men, and then Shin does the same. Just as Keisha tries to run away, Naki, a member of Konki's army that was sent to the Haishin unit, catches Keisha on a surprise flank. And with everyone out the way, the duel is set for Shin versus Keisha. And remember when I said one doesn't simply try to kill the main protagonist and live to tell it? Yeah, this is what I meant. Fatality. And with Keisha dead, that only leaves Kisui left to deal with. And let me just say, I feel very bad for Kisui because I would much rather have a fight to the death with Shin than have a psychological battle with Konki because this man very rarely gets his own hands dirty. With Konki focusing on Kisui unaware of Keisha's death, he calls for a full retreat surrounding the central hill to Zhao for good. You see, Konki and his army are not a normal army. Before becoming a Ken general, Konki became the ruler and leader of every mountain bandit clan in Ken. And every clan has its own special thing. Some some are scouters, some are looters, some are warriors, some are savages, and some are torturers. The Saki clan is something else, let me tell you. With the sun setting on the third day, all the battles have come to a close. But for Konki, that's when the real fight begins. Throughout the whole night, Konki sent his men to any nearby village for them to... Well, I bet you can guess what Mount Bennis do to helpless villagers. And with that, Konki sends a gift to Kisui after learning about his backstory of Rigan and he played on his fears. With this rainbow arc made out of villagers and a message to go along with it saying he will deliver an even greater tragedy upon Rigan. Basically saying if you don't pack up your shit and leave Kokoyo Hills, this will seem like a cakewalk. The term savage doesn't even do this man justice. He is the devil in human form. He's calculating, frightening, strong, and just all around terrifying. But he was able to win this campaign on the fourth day without a single casualty. I want you guys to just look up the rules of war and then read this arc. Then come back and comment on what rules of war this man didn't break. And if you think that's the worst thing he's ever done, I'm sorry, but you're sorely mistaken. I present to you our final piece of evidence today, receipt number 696. We have finally arrived at our final piece of evidence today, as if it wasn't already crystal clear what an absolute abomination this guy is. Like I said, this man Konki operates only on demon time. Scratch that, scratch that, that's, that's not even good enough anymore. This man only operates on devil time. Receipt number 696 consists of genocide. So at this time, Ken is finally close to conquering the first kingdom out of the other six and unifying all of China, starting with Zhao. The first obstacle to overcome was Konki's army of 80,000 versus Kocho's army of 240,000. With being numerically outnumbered, with the enemy having three times as many soldiers as you do, any sane man would simply pack up their shit and surrender. But we all know Konki is not sane not even in the fucking slightest. He enacts a plan so insane that not even Ozen himself would ever do. But that's the beauty of Konki. He's not afraid of anyone or anything. He knows that all these great generals like Zhao's three great heavens or Wei's seven fire dragons or even Kin's six great, they are all such great generals that have such big egos that they would never even consider the riskiest move to be the most viable. During this battle, Konki sent his men to fight with no clear goal in mind, just all out guerrilla warfare. And as you can imagine, many of Konki's men deserted. After all, they're mountain bandits, no loyalty to one another like an actual army. You see, Konki knew this, that from the get go, half of his army would run away. But he also knew that the enemy soldiers would chase after them. But this is where it comes to bite Zhao in the ass. Can you imagine running down 40,000 soldiers and keeping track of every single one? Of course not, it's physically impossible. That's where the beauty of Konki's plan lies. 
Among these deserters, there are three different types of people. Runners who ran from the battlefield, drawing in the enemy soldiers to chase them. Remainders who fought back with whatever few men they could. And the third group, the most important group of all, the hiders, who avoided confrontation at all costs, and hiding is the second nature to mountain bandits, with them all regrouping to one area, with Conky just standing there laughing at the enemy HQ. From the beginning, Conky planned to win this battle by taking the enemy supreme commander's head. Although he may not have gotten the chance to, you know, take his head and parade it around the battlefield, all the same, Conky from the beginning had Kocho O dancing in the palm of his hand. The war was over on the very first day. 240,000 soldiers versus 80,000 soldiers, and the underdogs come out on top, but not without casualties. Raido, pretty much Conky's second, was tortured and killed in the battlefield and stuffed in a chest as a present for Conky, a little retaliation for what happened at Kokoyo Hills. But the thing is, no one is able to ever get even with Conky. He is just too fucking twisted to let that shit go. Homie is definitely one to uh, hold a grudge. Because this war ended so fast, with casualties on the lower side, especially for Zhao, Qin has over 100,000 prisoners of war. And he sent a message to everyone in China saying, You fuck with me, and you'll pay for it. Killing and beheading every single prisoner in their care. 100,000 deaths, all gone within just a few hours hours. All for just one single man. Although he never shows emotion, Conky didn't just do this on a whim like he said he did to the king. Raido has been with Conky for a long time, and although they were never truly close, they had a strong enough bond that Conky is willing to slaughter 100,000 enemy soldiers and commit genocide. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes all the receipts I have for you today. Well, I still have more, but uh, I think that's enough to, you know, get the point across. We have witnessed the general who operates on demon time, committing first degree arson, committing every war crime there's ever been, and genocide. This man is truly a menace and needs to be stopped. But yeah, that's it for today. So uh, if you guys like this video, please uh, like, comment, and subscribe. I will see you guys next time.